tardes. Bienvenidos a esta sesión. Se llama Services Assemble, o como me gusta decir, Applying MVP Principles to Creating Cutting Edge Microservices uh, Without Chaos Using Spring Cloud and Netflix OSS. Mi nombre es Mark Heckler. Uh, soy desarrollador y evangelista de Pivotal. Uh, Pivotal son fabricantes de componentes como Spring Boot, Spring Framework, uh, Redis, RabbitMQ, Greenplum, uh, grandes contribuyentes a uh, Apache Tomcat y uh, Cloud Foundry uh, nos, con, uh, nos conocen. Um, ya que solo tenemos uh, 50 minutos y uh, hablo más rápidamente en inglés que en español, uh, cambiaré a inglés con su permiso. Sí, gracias. Okay. Uh, I will try not to go too fast, though, okay? <laughs> I, I only had half of my normal caffeine intake this morning. I only had one pot of coffee, so, so I think we'll be fine. Uh, as I said, I'm Mark Heckler. I am a uh, principal technologist and developer advocate with Pivotal. Um, we're, our time here is very short. That's the bad news. We only have 50 minutes, and I am very well aware that I stand between you and lunch, uh, so I won't be pushing that too hard. I'll try not to be pushing that too hard. I'll put it that way. Um, but if we run out of time, uh, by all means, please do reach out to me with any questions or feedback uh, via Twitter or email. Uh, I live on Twitter. Is anyone here on Twitter? Okay, good. I can barely see people, but I think I see hands out there. That's good. Um, I tweet all the time at MKHEC. If you're not following me, please do. Uh, and if you have any feedback, that's the fastest way to reach me. I live on Twitter from the time I get up to the time I go to bed and sometimes lying in bed. Uh, so, I have no life, it's true. Uh, but uh, for those of you who are not on Twitter or don't want to be on Twitter, or if you just have questions or feedback that takes more than 140 characters, I'm also a member of the slightly older and more established social network called Email. Is anyone here on Email? Okay, a few more, that's good. Uh, please do reach out to me. Mark at thehecklers.org is the easiest way to reach me by email. Um, but anyway, so let's, uh, let's dive in. Uh, who am I? Well, I am an author. I, I've uh, written several blogs and blog posts. I have co-authored one book. I have another in the pipeline, and I've contributed both text and code uh, to others. Uh, I speak around the world wherever people will let me, uh, and I appreciate you inviting me uh, back to Barcelona. Love this, uh, love this city, and the first time uh, to JVCNConf. First time it's worked, and I'm really happy to be here. So who's a first-timer this year? Okay, a few of you. I hope to be back. I hope you are too. Uh, I am a developer, and as you might guess from the next, uh, from the next bullet, uh, most of my expertise lies in Java. Uh, I am a Java champion recognized by my peers for contributions to the greater Java community, so if you had anything to do with that, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. And as I like to say, I'm a survivor of many monoliths. Uh, I was a reluctant convert to microservices. Because when you're very comfortable with something, even when you know it has problems, you're aware of those problems. You know how to work around them and with them. Uh, so I, I uh, wasn't necessarily running fast and, and furiously to microservices, but I am a convert, and you'll see that, I think, as we go along, because I am a seeker of a better way, and I'm convinced uh, that microservices are a better way. So uh, these, as I like to say, are microservices. Uh, if we were to create one giant monolithic superhero, let's call it monolith man or monolith woman, if you choose, uh, it wouldn't be very interesting, right? We wouldn't be able to optimize for any particular power. We would have this kind of jumbled uh, mess, this ball of mud superhero that would try to do everything. And, and not to get too geeky, but I think we've kind of seen that in if, is anyone a comics nerd, by the way? Oh, really? Nobody? Wow, okay, I have no life, clearly, obviously. <laughs> um, Okay, I do have to stop and tell you. Uh, I, my wife tells me that I am unintentionally funny. Divertido sin realizar, okay? So if I say something funny, chances are I didn't mean to, but that's okay. Laugh, it encourages me. I do take pity laughs, that's, that's cool. Um, but uh, in, this, in the comic world, Superman got to be too powerful, nobody cared. Very uninteresting, right? Uh, you know, could do everything, you know, maybe didn't do anything well, but did a lot of stuff. Uh, so what did DC do? They kind of de-escalated. They, they, they dropped him down to where he was a much more interesting character. And I think when you, when you highlight the expertise or the abilities of a particular microservice, you tailor them to a specific need and a specific purpose. 
uh, it makes them much, much stronger as a team. Uh, and that's my shameless tie-in and plug with the Avengers. So where are we going today? This is what I like to point to first. Uh, because distributed systems are hard, right? They introduce certain complexities. And if you don't introduce as well ways to manage that complexity and leverage that to make gains, you're actually only making the situation worse. Um, so when you introduce uh, complexity into your system, distri distribution, distributed systems, uh, you need a couple of different kinds of enablers. Enablers for your, your microservices to find and, and interact with each other and enablers for us, so we can reason about our systems. Um, and I'll discuss those as we kind of go along, of course. But uh, who here is a Java developer? Trick question, right? Everybody here should be raising their hand. If not, you should be like aspiring to be a Java developer, right? OK. Uh, who here uses Spring? It's really tough to see, but I'm seeing, I think I see a lot of hands. Spring Boot? OK, good. That's, that's a good, good smattering. Uh, are you familiar with 12-factor applications? or cloud native, OK? Um, to provide a little bit of context, uh, Heroku engineers a few years back came up with a 12-factor manifesto. Everything always has to start with a manifesto, right, in our field. Uh, but, but basically, it highlighted, the in their mind, 12 things that needed to be in place for an application to be a good cloud citizen. Uh, and, and all of those are, are important, but I kind of look to uh, two or three of those as the first among peers. Uh, and I discuss those kind of as we go as well. But, but certainly, when it comes to uh, uh, exposing ports for services and um, uh, externalizing your configuration so you're not uh, putting magic strings in your code and things like that, uh, bundling your dependencies so you maintain and manage your dependencies yourself versus having external, uh, uh, external dependencies that can break out from under you uh, due to no fault of yours or your application. Um, those are good habits, those are good practices for, for software to, uh, to embody when you move it to the cloud. Uh, so good ways to do that are to build using Spring Boot. Spring Boot allows you to uh, externalize uh, your dependent, or excuse me, internalize your dependencies to bundle them with you and externalize your configuration, which I go into uh, in the next slide, as a matter of fact. Spring Cloud gives you the capabilities to do a lot of that. Uh, as it says up here, Spring Cloud was designed for fragile infrastructure in partnership with Netflix. Has anyone heard of Netflix? It's a tiny little movie streaming company. You may have heard of it. If not, you probably will. Uh, Netflix uh, has a very real problem. If they go down, a lot of people are very, very unhappy. So of course, they build uh, for resilience. They build for scalability, reliability, all of the illities. Uh, and but, I guess a, a but part of that is that they build specifically for AWS. Because at this point in time, at least, all of their services are deployed via AWS. Now, sometimes our engineers work alongside with them, with them from the beginning. Sometimes they take their uh, open source components and abstract from them to make them more generally usable across various cloud platforms. But either way, we have some Netflix open source software components. We have some Spring Cloud OSS components. And we blend those together to create what I said earlier, which is enablers. Some of those enablers uh, fall into the following categories. And I have examples in the right-hand column, but they're not exhaustive. Uh, so we need certain things like a centralized configuration uh, setup. Now, you typically with configuration, if you have strings embedded in your software that tells your software how to work, that is problematic enough with a monolith. But what happens if you have multiple instances of a microservice and you embed that? That gets to be problematic as well. What happens if a backing service changes its location? If a database goes offline and you need to rehome that somewhere else, if that's within your code, you have to rebuild your code, redeploy it, retest it. So all of these things go into what should be effectively a string change, right? You're just telling it to point somewhere else. Um, with, with configuration settings, you typically have key values pairs. And that's just text. And we deal with text every day uh, when it comes to auditing and version control and things like that, right? And what do we use? We use things like Git or SVN, but it's 2017, so usually Git. Um, and we need to have some way of externalizing that from our application so that we can change that at runtime without having to do a rebuild, test, and deploy cycle. Uh, that's where something like Spring Cloud Config comes into place. It uses uh, Git repositories underneath uh, to handle the auditing and version control. It can also uh, back to HashiCorp Console and things like that, uh, Vault, 
So you have options, but it all comes down to this. You're externalizing that configuration from your applications, from your microservices. That's a good thing. Uh, without introducing new bottlenecks into your application. And I explain that kind of as we get into the code. You also need some place where your services can register and, and see and be seen. So in the cloud world, it's very ephemeral, right? If we have 10 instances of a microservice and one dies here, our cloud platform may spin up a replacement here. So how are microservices that consume that microservice going to find it? That's where a service registry comes in. So you have things like Netflix Eureka or Zookeeper or Console. Uh, so uh, typically, I show Netflix Eureka because it's a very good product out of Netflix, uh, Netflix OSS, fully open source. Uh, and it works very well for this kind of thing, as well as many other things. But of course, I primarily show it uh, in the context of service registry and discovery. You also want things like a circuit breaker. Now, just as in your house, uh, a circuit breaker allows you to gracefully degrade capabilities without major loss. So if you have a wiring problem in your master bedroom, hopefully you just lose power to your master bedroom. Maybe you lose power to your house, but your house doesn't burn down. So that's a plus, right? Uh, for those of you who are Netflix subscribers, uh, if you go to netflix.com, the main page, uh, that is fed by a number of microservices, about 500. Now, the odds are at any given point in time that any one of those microservices is not the only instance of its kind running anywhere in the world. It has multiple other instances of the same kind running. So just to do some simple math, if each one of those had, let's say, 10 instances running, that's 5,000 instances of microservices running at any given point in time to feed that one single pane of glass. So that's a lot, right? Uh, and that's why a service registry comes into being very important. Things like uh, a, a cloud, uh, excuse me, a centralized configuration uh, facility as well. Uh, circuit breakers, if something happens to our backing service, we don't want our capabilities to go offline. We don't ever want to see that giant white screen with the black lettering that says <laughs> you have a problem. Uh, when in Netflix, if the recommendation engine goes offline, you never see an empty box across the middle. Instead of seeing recommendations for you, you may see something like uh, popular in your area this week. So it's less functionality, but it degrades gracefully and still keeps you online, keeps you happy, and keeps providing something of value to you, the user. Uh, we'll also talk about things like a load balancer. Uh, Netflix employs Ribbon as a client-side load balancer. Now, client-side meaning a consuming microservice. So again, we don't introduce a new bottleneck on the back end that, that routes every bit of traffic through that. Uh, we, and again, we also don't have a single point of failure because it caches those values. It's Eureka aware, service registry aware. So if there's ever a loss of connection, it maintains a list of backing services uh, from Eureka. And then, of course, when it reconnects, then it goes ahead and refreshes that and what have you. Uh, Zool is used for intelligent routing. Is anyone familiar with uh, Hittite mythology? Ghostbusters? Anything? It's really quiet. Are you guys still awake out there? Anybody? OK. All right. Well, I heard a laugh, so we'll assume that uh, somebody is. So um, Zool provides intelligent routing. It allows you to externalize your routing from your application. So that, again, if something changes, you're able to update that externally. If you're migrating from a monolith to microservices, you can slowly migrate off of a monolith-focused API and reroute those calls somewhere else, updating uh, the configuration files for Zool as well, which again are served up from your uh, Spring Cloud config server. Then we talk about some things like asynchronous messaging. Uh, in many cases, you need some asynchronicity. You don't need a fully reactive implementation. Or perhaps in this case, uh, while that might be uh, considered, what you really need is a way to fire and forget. And you have an asynchronous message queue already in place in your company or organization. So we show you how to use that. Uh, via Spring Cloud Streams. Uh, and then, of course, you might need something like distributed tracing. Uh, we have a, an offering called Spring Cloud Sleuth, or Zipkin, uh, which combine to provide you that uh, interactive tracing, distributed tracing across microservices, uh, whether it's via HTTP request or via a Spring Cloud Stream as well. And by the way, I'll give you a little plug uh, for Adrian Cole's session later. Uh, I guess it's right after lunch. Uh, on Zipkin and distributed tracing. If you haven't seen him present that, please do. Please take this opportunity to see him. Uh, Adrian came to us from Twitter, uh, where he worked on Zipkin. Uh, Twitter was originally a Zipkin project based upon the Google Dapper papers. It has a great pedigree. And Adrian is taking that in really cool directions uh, today and, and currently 
uh, on our behalf. So um, it's a really good session to catch as well. And then, of course, tie it all together with security, with Spring Cloud security. Uh, and there's so much more. But obviously, again, we only have uh, 50 minutes. So what I'd like to do is kind of get started and see how far we can take this. And then, again, if we, uh, we'll get as far as we can with things before the time expires. And then I'll let you go to lunch. And then we can talk about it later or online. So let's smash this, shall we? OK. Everyone is still awake out there, right? OK, good, 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 good. Uh, I will come back to this at the end, uh, some helpful links. I usually forget that. So Philip, if you'd remind me for the end. Uh, excellent. OK, good, good, good. All right, uh, so let me mirror the displays. And hopefully that will be semi-legible. Oh, that's boom, 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 boom. OK, that's better, right? Yeah, nice. OK, take a drink here before I run out of steam. If you're starting with microservices, uh, here's an excellent place to start. Uh, the Spring Initializer is kind of where we start our journey with Spring Boot-based microservices. Sometimes you hear this referred to by the, uh, by the URL, by the actual address start.spring.io. Okay? That's very important. If you haven't heard that before, you'll hear it many, many times afterward. Uh, but you can curl that, or you can use the Spring command line interface. I always use the Spring Initializer, the web page, because it's so pretty. Really? Nobody? Nothing? OK. <sighs> All right. Well, here we go. Uh, it allows you, and some of you who have used Spring products uh, or Cloud Foundry have heard the, the, uh, the term opinionated. It's an opinionated platform. It has an opinionated approach. What does that mean? Uh, in short, what it basically means is that if you are writing to that 80 to 90% of use cases, we want to make this extremely easy for you to get up and running fast and start creating real business value with your software. Uh, in the old days of frameworks, there was usually exactly one way to do any particular task, and that was the framework way. And if you didn't do it the framework way, too bad. Uh, with an opinionated approach, again, that 80 to 90% should be very easy. If you have a use case that falls outside of that 80 to 90% use case, we still want to help you do it, but we want to get out of your way quickly so you can do it with as, as little effort as possible, but obviously a little more effort than that 80 to 90% use case. So uh, this is kind of an example of that right here, because you don't have to provide a lot of information to get started with a very simple Spring Boot application. Uh, you can. If we switch to the full version, you can see that we have a lot of different options you can choose from. So you can go crazy with this. Uh, I usually just go to the simple version and start from there. So right off the bat, you can see that we can choose to, if we're a Maven developer, we can choose to develop a Maven project. Uh, or if we're a hipster, we can choose Gradle. Uh, I'm not a hipster, so I'm going to go with Maven. Uh, we don't have to even choose Java. We can use Groovy or Kotlin, great languages. I'm going to stay with Java for today. Uh, and we get to choose which version of Spring Boot. Typically, it's the current version shown in the uh, list, plus one before, one after. Uh, in this case, we have up through 2.0, uh, Milestone 2, which allows us to play with some of the reactive bits. I'm not going to be talking about that today, but I also have another talk that I give solo or in tag teaming with my buddy Josh. Uh, but uh, we're, we'll postpone that for another day. But they are there if you want to start playing with some of that stuff. Today, we're going to stay with the production version. Uh, and I'm going to uh, just provide the artifact name. Again, you can choose to do a lot of different things. So you can choose uh, jar versus war packaging. We always recommend jars. Why? Because of that whole 12-factor idea. We want to bring our dependencies and bundle them with us. And creating an Uber jar allows us to do just that. If you're curious how Spring Boot does it, it's different from shade, uh, from shading, like the uh, um, Maven shade plugin. Uh, what it does is actually nest the jars. It's very unique and inter interesting. Uh, if you want to uh, visit the uh, Spring Boot documentation, I think it's Appendix A, will give you a, some good bedtime reading on that. Really fascinating stuff. Uh, so for now, we're just going to create a config service, right? And I'm going to specify my dependencies just by starting to type them. Again, you can pull down the list and, and choose off the eye chart. I typically just do this because I think it's faster and easier. So I choose the dependency for a config service. And I'm going to save that to my desktop, uh, just to get up and going quickly. And let's open that. And we'll unzip that. And we'll open that in our favorite IDE, uh, which is IntelliJ, right? Right? OK, doesn't matter. 
Uh, Spring Boot, uh, Spring Framework projects are equally supported in NetBeans and uh, Eclipse. Uh, we even have a distro of Eclipse called SDS, Spring Tool Suite. All are excellent options. I typically just use IntelliJ IDEA because it's awesome and because I'm used to it. So that looks awfully small. Let's see. See if I switched this already or if I forgot. I, oh, it is set to ambiguist. Okay, so we're good on our, our size. So the first thing that we want to do is go to our application.properties file. Now, this is for our config service. Everything else, and, and there are different ways to do this, different approaches, but I like to anchor everything to my config service personally. That's how I like to do it. Uh, so I'm going to provide a certain uh, few basic uh, configuration parameters to my config service because obviously I can't have my config service look for my config service to get its properties. Uh, so I'm going to just tell it to uh, run on server.port 8888. I'm going to run everything locally today uh, just because I, I find that I, I, when I go to different conferences, you don't always know how the Wi-Fi will hold up, and I don't like to stress that any more than I have to. Uh, and then I'm going to do a uh, point to a spring, if I can type, cloud config server get URI. Uh, you can point this to a Git repository, GitLab, GitHub, Bitbucket, a local or a network drive uh, or a cloud-based uh, Git repo. I'm going to point this to my hard drive. Uh, there are going to be certain things that I do today that are not best practices. This is not a production best practice, right? This probably doesn't need to be said, uh, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, and I'm going to point this to a local uh, repository, dev, I can't even type today. This is the problem. I, I, if I do this, I'll probably type better. But uh, I tell you what, uh, sometimes in my demos, I, I actually insert, intentionally insert typos uh, just to see if you all are awake. So uh, those of you here in the front few rows, it's on you. If I typo, you're, it's your responsibility to catch that, okay? Okay, good, 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 good. All right, so I'm going to point this to a uh, repository called YAML Microservices Config. Uh, now, you can use key value pairs in properties files. You can also use YAML if you want to... Um, uh, provide some nesting and a little more structure and ease of readability uh, for us poor humans. I typically use YAML, uh, so I'm going to point to that, and I'm going to uh, go to my main application class and enable uh, config server, and I'm going to start that up. Now, I should point out that the Spring Initializer does not uh, generate code for you. I mean, it creates your main class, your main method, uh, but that's it. It actually just uh, in includes the dependencies you specify into a Gradle build file or a Maven bomb, Maven Palm, uh, and zips up the project so you can download it and start coding yourself. But it does quickly get out of your way. It provides the basic framework for you to build from. Okay, so we're up and running. Let's take a quick look and see what we have. So local host, a, oops, 8888, and we'll go to edge service. Oh, that's good, not very readable. So let's blow that up a little bit. Now, I, I should have pointed out that, again, this is um, just a Git repo sitting underneath this. So you'll have something like this. You'll have different files uh, of properties or YAML files consisting of properties. Uh, so you'll have something called application.properties or application.yaml, which will be applied uh, to all microservices that contact the config service for properties. It'll get those just by default. If it identifies itself as something, like an auth service, or an edge service, or a Eureka service, it will also get properties for that specific kind of service. Uh, if it's deployed to cloud, something like Cloud Foundry, it will automatically default to a cloud profile, so it will get the application cloud properties in lieu of application properties. So it allows you to define a lot of different levels of properties and sort them out uh, as applicable to the property uh, in question. So, for instance, for my edge service, I would get these properties, which apply to all, uh, all microservices, and then I would get these additional properties that apply only to my edge service. Now, what if you have a conflict? Well, more specific wins, so even then there's not a conflict. What if your config service goes offline? Now, chances are you're not running only one config service anywhere on the internet, but if you were, uh, again, your application, when it starts up, you'll provide certain basic fundamental uh, sensible defaults in your application properties file. Uh, and then, of course, once it establishes connection with that config service, it will grab those properties. If it goes offline once it's running, it still caches those. So then once it reestablishes connection, it refreshes those. So uh, either way, you're covered. And that's the config service. Not, uh, not overly glamorous, but it's really essential to the working. So what's up next? 
Well, again, next we probably want to look at some kind of a service registry, right? So let's do our Eureka service. We won't need our config server uh, uh, dependency. Uh, so we will, though, however, want this to be a config client. So our, our service registry can reach out and get its properties from our config service. And then, of course, we want to um, uh, add the dependency for our Eureka server. Let's go ahead and generate the project, save it, uh, go back over here. We'll open that up. And we'll open it up in our IDE. And we do it a, a little bit differently at this point, uh, because at this point, we don't have or we shouldn't necessarily care if we have an application.properties file. What happens with the Spring Boot application is when the application context is initialized, it looks for an application.properties. Uh, but we kind of want to get out ahead of that. We want to get out into the bootstrap phase so we can point it to our config service. So what we do at this point, the easiest way is to, we'll go to our application properties file, and then let's, uh, let's pull it up in our properties project, uh, and then we'll change that to bootstrap.properties. And that's the way that we uh, kind of key things in, key our Spring Boot application in, to go and look for that and then find our config service. So the first thing we probably want to do is specify the application name. In this case, it's Eureka service. And then we'll want to point it to our Spring Cloud Configury, which, as you may recall, we're running on HTTP colon slash slash localhost 8888. And then we'll go to our main application class. And we will at enable uh, Eureka server. And we'll run that. OK. Now, for those of you longtime Java programmers, you probably heard everybody battering on you, telling you that Java is very verbose. Uh, there's a lot of boilerplate. Haven't seen a lot of that today, have you? So if you're new to Spring Boot, uh, if you're new to Spring Cloud, you'll probably get a pretty good feel on how, how concise you can be, even with Java, which is very, very nice. Let's you focus again on that business value. So we see here that we're started up and running on port 8761. And as you might imagine, where we got that is, uh, let's go back to here, and we'll go to our Eureka service, properties. And as we can see here, we want to start up on port 8761. So we know it's working, right? We know it's reaching out to our config service and getting values. So let's pull up our dashboard for Eureka. Now, the dashboard has no value for your microservices. Your dashboard is for you. So it's for us, as we like to say, the meatware for, for the people. So we can reason about our microservices and see what's where and how it's all working together. So we see that's up and running. Some good information here, but kind of the key bits are here, our replicas. In this case, I'm not uh, mirroring this. I'm not uh, running this in a highly available configuration. I have exactly one instance. Uh, and we have no instances of microservices at all registered with it yet. So that's our next stop. So that's where we'll go next. And I'm still OK on time, so that's good. So let's go back to our uh, Spring Initializer, again, where everything starts. And let's create a quote service. Is anybody a fan of quotes? Movie quotes? Really? Nobody? Oh, somebody in the back. OK, you're my new best friend. OK. So you know, I told you earlier I recognize I have no life, but I really love really good movie quotes or even TV show quotes. Really? Nobody? OK, well, you and I will talk afterwards. Uh, so I like to collect them. I like to save them. I just think they're cool. Uh, so you're along for the ride. Too bad. So I'm going to create a quote service that lets us store and retrieve really clever quotes. And then we're going to provide uh, some kind of an edge service to consume that. And uh, again, if time, time permits, we should be in good shape there. So again, we're going to want this to be a config client so we can reach out and get its properties from our config service. I'm also going to want to add the dependency for Eureka Discovery so it can register with our Eureka service so it can see and be seen within our service registry. Uh, and then I'm going to add in Lombok. Uh, Lombok is, as I like to call it, for lazy developers. I am a lazy developer. It is a good thing to be a lazy developer. Why would you want to reinvent code that, that has already been done for you? Very robust code. So I can focus with Lombok on the business value. It, it allows me to ha not have to specify all the getters and setters and toString and hash code and equals. So we're going to be using that. I kind of have a love-hate relationship with Lombok. Right now, I'm loving it, so we'll, we'll go with that. Um, and since this is supposed to store and retrieve quotes, I need some mechanism to do that. I'm going to use JPA, not because it's the best, but as a colleague of mine likes to tell me, sometimes I make poor life choices. So JPA it is. 
Uh, and I'm going to choose H2, which is an embedded database, which is JPA compliant. If you choose to use MySQL or Oracle or, or Microsoft SQL Server or any JPA compliant database, that's fine. Uh, by the way, Spring Data also supports things like uh, Redis and, and uh, uh, Greenplum and, and uh, Mongo and Couchbase and Cassandra and Neo4j and what have you. But again, we're going to stick with pretty simple stuff with JPA and H2. Uh, I'm also going to bring in the dependency for REST repositories which allows us to expose our Spring Data repository as REST endpoints pretty much automatically and build off of that pretty quickly. Very nice capability. I'm also going to bring in the um, dependency for hate OAS. I know some people pronounce that differently, but those people are wrong. Okay? As somebody who has worked on a product called OAS in the past, I can assure you that hate OAS is the correct pronunciation. Uh, I'm also going to bring in the uh, HAL browser, which lets us uh, exercise our REST endpoints without developing a full application, uh, and do some other kind of neat stuff just for the price of a free dependency, which is kind of nice. Uh, I'm also going to bring in Stream Rabbit uh, because I'm a hopeless optimist when it comes to time, and I hope we'll have time for that. Uh, and uh, Zip and Client, and let's see, do I have everything I kind of want? Yeah, close enough. Okay. Wow. Okay, so we're in good shape. Uh, so far on time. So I'm going to save that and I'll save that to the desktop. We'll open that up and then we'll open that up in our IDE. Oops, let's see. Do, do, do. Get another quick drink. I tend to get parched if I don't keep uh, doing that. Okay, so again, the first step is to find our application.properties file. We'll quickly rename that to to bootstrap.properties and we'll open that and we'll provide again our spring.cloud configury http colon slash slash localhost 8888 and then we'll provide again our spring application name which is in this case quote service service we'll go to our main application class and uh, we want to annotate this as a discovery client this will uh, notify our Spring Boot application that it needs to register with our Eureka service, right? So what do we need to do first? Well, the first thing we should probably provide is our, our, um, our domain model. So I'm going to, uh, since we're using JPA, I'm going to define a JPA entity. And since I'm using Lombok, I'm going to specify a data class. Uh, this allows me, again, to not have to create uh, my getters, setters, equals, and hash code. Very nice. Uh, I'm also going to tell Lombok to provide a no args constructor for me and an all args constructor, and then we'll get that into business. So we'll call this class quote. Clever, right? For a quote class. Uh, and then I'm going to specify again, uh, provide a couple of uh, hints, if you will, for, uh, for uh, JPA that this is our ID, and we're going to ask it to generate the value for us. With H2, it's, that's enough. Uh, with MySQL, you have to provide a little more guidance, uh, but what have you. I'm going to create an ID field of type long, and then for a quote, we'll want to create a couple of string fields. Ooh, front row, I almost you know, took care of that for you. Uh, and for a quote, we'll want to track something like text and source. And then because I think I'm probably going to need a constructor with a couple of args, we'll just go ahead and provide that as well. So that's our domain model. Pretty quick and simple, right? Very little code. Now I want to uh, define an interface. We'll call it a quote repository which allows me to abstract from our underlying uh, data repository. We'll extend our, a CRUD repository, which is an interface defined in Spring Data. We define it for objects of type quote with an ID of type long. And then I'm going to annotate that as a repository REST resource, which again takes that Spring Data repository and exposes it as REST endpoints without any more code whatsoever. It's very nice. Now this actually gets us up and running. This is a fully functional application, but it's hard to see what's going on without any data, right? So I always like to add in some test data, uh, and I'm going to do that by creating a bean uh, that implements the command line runner interface, uh, and we're going to, uh, to in inject our quote repository here. Is anyone familiar with um, uh, Java 8 functional interfaces? Okay, uh, command line runner is a functional interface. It has a single abstract method called run. We're, gonna sp we're going to provide the Lambda implementation for that going to return strings, uh, kind of quickly run through this. And since even I can't type that fast, I'm going to copy paste some great movie quotes in there for you, right? And because again, I like to see what's going on, I'm going to do a find all dot for each system dot out print line. 
uh, method reference, and we're off and running. And assuming the front row didn't let me down or front few rows didn't let me down, this all should work, right? Okay. Okay, so, oh, it looks like they're up and running. Okay, so it looks like we have nine quotes in there, some really good ones, right, across all time periods, some excellent movie quotes. If you're not familiar with any of those, that is your assignment for tonight, right, to look up all these movies and watch them all before, before next weekend or before next week. So it looks like everything is running, but the proof's in the pudding. So I always like to go and pull it up. So localhost 8088, 8088. Uh, and let's just start there, right? I mentioned earlier, hate OAS and the HAL browser. This is the HAL browser. So without uh, going to our context route, we actually pull up our HAL browser. And as you can see, uh, we had defined a JPA entity called quote. So now we have an endpoint, which is a collection of quotes. We can get that, we can perform a get, and we can see that we can navigate to each of our quotes. So you can also navigate into each one of these. Now, you don't have to do a get. You can actually do a non-get. So you can do a put or a post or a delete. And again, you can fully exercise that, that, those REST endpoints without developing a full application around it, which is kind of a nice capability. And that, again, is a for the cost of a free, uh, free uh, dependency. So let's go in, and we'll just go straight to our quotes. And this is very nice, right? So we have all quotes, and we can navigate to a particular quote but that's not really very good when it comes to a quote application, right? We're used to things like a quote of the day app where we can just get a random quote. So this is a little lame, even for my standards. So let's, let's kick this up a notch. Is everyone still with me? You're loving this, right? Right? Good stuff, quotes, all right. All right, so what are we gonna do? Well, let's define, let's define a rest controller, rest controller. Uh, we'll call this, again, cleverly enough, class quote controller. Contro Controller. Okay, and first we will inject final quote quote repository, and uh, let's do constructor injection because again that's the way to go. Whoops, boom boom. Yeah, typos easy. Okay, so I'm going to define a random endpoint. Uh, that's very simply done. We'll do a get mapping uh, for slash random random. And we'll do a public method returning a quote, quote, get, random, quote. So far, so good, right? So what do we do? We'll do a return, quote, repository dot. Now, here's where Spring Data, as useful as it is, it provides a lot of functionality out of the box with very little code or almost no code on your part. But it can't read your mind. So it expects you or it allows you to, to extend that with certain capabilities uh, very quickly and easily. So I'm going to just define here, oops, at query, a query. And you can use uh, standard SQL or J JPQL. I'm going to use JPQL because that uh, doesn't tie me to a specific underlying data store. Uh, something along the lines of select Q from quote Q order by rand, which gets us a random order list, if you will, of quotes, right? And we'll define that method signature, get quotes random order, right? That is enough for Spring Data to understand what you're asking of it. So we can then reference our new method, get quotes random order, get zero, and that, crude but effective, right? So that'll return us a random quote each time we access that endpoint. So that gets us kind of what we need from our backing service, which still gives us time to develop an edge service. So we're in good shape. It's all about the clock, right? Racing that clock. So we're up and running. Uh, again, let's go back and let's check this, make sure we get to our quotes. I always like to verify things still work, always a plus. Now let's go up and we'll see if our random endpoint works. It does, okay. So we have some excellent quotes here, some really good ones, right? Recognize all those? Okay, again, that's your assignment. So this is our backing service. We now have a backing service, now we need a consuming microservice, right? So let's create that, again, very quickly. Uh, we're going to uh, go here. Wow, okay, we are gonna make this really quickly. Uh, I'm gonna create an edge service, and as an edge service, we're not going to be concerned about storing and retrieving data, that's why we have our backing service. So we won't need JPA, we won't need H2, we won't need REST repositories. 
I want to define a web API, so I bring that in. I want to hopefully, if we have time, uh, show a little bit of actuator's capabilities uh, because that's kind of a nice little extra as well. Uh, and that, uh, let's see. Oh, I also want to bring in Hystrix, Ribbon, and Zool. And again, we'll see how much time we have for all of this. And we'll generate the project. OK, so let's go to our edge service. We'll open that and open that in our IDE. Once again, we'll go to our application.properties. We'll rename that to bootstrap.properties. We'll open bootstrap.properties. We'll provide an application name. This is our edge service. And we'll point this to our cloud configury, which is http colon slash slash localhost 8888. We'll go to our main application class. And we will enable our Zool proxy. Now, you're probably wondering at this point why I didn't enable Discovery Client. Because we still need this to be Eureka aware, right? Well, again, Hystrix, Ribbon, and Zool kind of operate as a package. Th and they're all Eureka aware. So if you go here, we can see we'll dry, drill into our enable Zool proxy annotation, and we can see that it is a meta annotation. So we're wrapping in our enable circuit breaker annotation and discovery client and our Zool proxy configuration. So we get all of that kind of for one annotation while keeping our main application class very clean. So I'm going to quickly dive into this and see how far we get, and then we'll break for lunch. And again, happy to discuss this at length further on down the road. Again, we're not looking to store this as a JPA entity, so we can just focus on our Lombok. Uh, we'll create a NoRx instructor, have Lombok do that for us, rather. And we'll create our quote class, uh, which has a private uh, long ID and private string text and source. OK, and again, we'll probably want a two-arc constructor. OK, let's create. And I guess as it is, let's run, let's run this. And this is a fully functioning application. I wouldn't even have to have defined the quote class to do this. Because at this point, you already have a microproxy. Uh, I guess I should go out, pop out here, and show you our edge service properties. And as you can see here, I've defined some routes in Zool. The first one is kind of key. If you notice, I'm pointing to the quote service by name. Because Zool is Eureka aware. So when I register a quote service in Eureka, Zool knows where to find this quote service. It looks for instances of this quote service. So when I hit our edge service with a QS route, it will know to route that, reroute that to our quote services behind the scenes. That is a microproxy. And if that is good enough, if that serves your, your use case, then you're done. You don't even have to add any code. Typically, we add code because that doesn't solve our needs. Uh, we may have multiple backend services that we bring the inputs together and munge them and manipulate them in order to provide a streamlined set of data for our edge services. But if that does get your, your needs fulfilled, then you're done. Uh, so let's go ahead and quickly go here to localhost 8086 slash QS slash quotes, which looks very similar to this, right? The same. It just does the URL rewriting for you. And that is just by defining the path, the, uh, the route in Zool. So let's go ahead and wrap up here with one more thing, because I do want to show you this. Uh, I'm going to create a REST controller. We're going to call this class quote, oops, class quote controller here in our edge service. Uh, and I'm going to, let's see, let's do a get mapping uh, for quote Orama. Uh, naming things is hard, right? Uh, so I'm going to do a public quote get random quote. OK. Now, I showed you kind of how Zool does that automatically. I kind of like to show you the manual way that happens or the way things happen manually behind the scenes to kind of show you what Zool is doing. This is not a best practice. I don't recommend this uh, in terms of a production app, but I think it's instructive to see. So I'm going to create a load balanced bean. Whoa, all right. We can do this, right? OK, uh, I'm going to uh, have it return uh, a, uh, an, an object that implements the REST operations uh, Interface, REST operations, return, REST, return, new REST template. Yep, OK. So I'm also going to now do a private, private, final REST operations, REST operations. Boom. There we go. So now I can do a return 
rest operations dot get for object http colon slash slash quote ah I keep bumping my uh, my uh, trackpad here quote service slash random and return an object of type quote okay this is kind of a manual way to do this but again I like to show this because in of course when I have time for Zepkin it actually makes a very nice uh, route that we can follow all the way through but it's not gonna happen today uh, but we have a load balanced bean which is using our um, ribbon client side load balancer uh, and as you can see here we're not providing a valid URL per se we're actually providing the name of a microservice that we're registering with Eureka so this is all Eureka aware as well so now if we go out here and we will go straight to our quota Rama endpoint Yes, it works, okay? But now let's go and hit our quote endpoint, which you're probably wondering where this came from. So let's go out and look at our second Zool route that I've defined, which I've just called demo. You can call it whatever you want, label it however you want. Uh, but it has a path of quote. Uh, and you can use that to forward to public API URLs or local URLs. In this case, I'm forwarding it to a local URL called Quotorama, which again then references our quote service in uh, Eureka via Zool and then makes that connection indirectly. So as you can see, you're, you're creating routes external to your application, which allows you a great deal of power in a microservices architecture to make changes without doing a rebuild, retest, redeploy cycle. So I didn't get nearly as much covered as I wanted to, but hopefully I covered what I did very well. Uh, if not, please give me that feedback as well. And I'm going to switch back at this point in time uh, we'll mirror or unmirror this and then I will start this up again and come back to this so some helpful links please do reach out to me if you have any questions comments uh, I if you look at the bottom one here this is a meta repository which actually has all of the things that I did cover and all of the things that I didn't cover uh, in terms of repositories and code uh, but I threw in a couple of other things uh, at, at Pivotal, we're very good about creating very small bite-sized guides as well as some more exhaustive guides. Those are listed uh, or accessible via the link at the top. And then, of course, everything we do pretty much is open source. So I've thrown out the uh, Spring Boot and Spring Cloud uh, projects. Uh, star those, follow those, watch those. Uh, you know, keep in touch with those. Uh, what I always tell people is to download the bits. But more than that, download the code and play with it and uh, see what you think. Let us know. Give us feedback. We're on Getter. So, uh, just kind of in summary, microservices can be hard, no kidding, but they don't have to be, right? Leverage enablers to make your life simpler and your code better and your systems more resilient uh, and more scalable, quite frankly. Uh, build for speed and resilience. And remember, if Netflix does it, so can you. So, thanks for coming. <laughs>